Hello, everyone. Welcome to episode 361 of the Juice Box Podcast. On today's show, we're going to let the good times roll. And by that, I mean we're going to try something a little different. I'm having a person with type 1 diabetes, Justin, he's an adult, and his mother, who, and this may not surprise you, is also an adult. That's not the point. The point is Justin's mom kind of fills in some of the questions about diagnosis in the early days, and then we move on to Justin, who talks about having type 1 diabetes now, and his career as a chef, and many other things. As you're listening, please do me the favor of remembering that nothing you hear on the Juice Box podcast should be considered advice, medical or otherwise. Please always consult a physician before making any changes to your healthcare plan or becoming bold with insulin. Do you have an absolutely favorite diabetes endocrinologist, doctor, nutritionist, nurse practitioner, somebody you love and you'd like to share it with someone else? Head to juiceboxdocs.com. Not only will you find a list of listener approved doctors, but you can add to that list by sending an email with your favorite doc and their deets. Doc and their deets. Juiceboxdocs.com. This episode of the podcast is sponsored by the Contour Next One Blood Glucose Meter and Touched by Type 1. Touched by Type 1 can be found at touchedbytype1.org. When you visit their website, you'll see a list of their programs, their awareness campaigns, and how you can get involved with supporting people who have type 1 diabetes. Elizabeth Forrest is their founder. She's a wonderful person. I've met her a number of times, and each time I've come away feeling warmer than the last. And you may absolutely have that experience as well when you visit touchedbytype1.org. Hey, are you perhaps in the market for a new blood glucose meter? Have you been using the same old meter for far too long and you're sort of unsure of how accurate it is? I mean, how long ago was it designed and made? Are you holding like a 10-year-old piece of technology in your hand and hoping it's going to tell you what your blood sugar is? Are you tired of test strips that fail and throwing them away and being wasteful, not being able to see the test strip at night? Having this meter that's hard to hold in your hand and and do what you need to do at the same time? Are these things happening to you and you think, I wish they weren't? Well, they don't have to because you could go to contournext.com forward slash juice box and find out all about the Contour Next One blood glucose meter. What you're going to find is a meter that is easy to handle, easy to read, easy to see the test strip at night, and incredibly accurate. These are the things you need from a blood glucose meter handleability, test strips that you're not always throwing away because it didn't go quite right, because this test strip has a second chance. You can go in, hit a little blood, not quite get it all, come back out, try again. It's a great meter. My daughter's been using it for a while now. And um, I mean, I don't want to throw any shade on any other meters, but this is the best one she's ever used. Head over to contournext.com forward slash juice box and find out more. There's all kinds of links there, even about savings programs, Possibility of getting a free Contour Next One meter. Check it out. Contournext.com forward slash juice box with the links in your show notes or at juiceboxpodcast.com. When you support the sponsors, you're supporting the show. And I appreciate that very much. Hi, my name is Justin. I'm 39. I've been diabetic um, for 36 plus years. And uh, yeah, it's cold in Minnesota. That's where you're at. Uh, now, also on the on the show is Justin's mom, Corey. Corey, can you say hello? Hello, everyone. I'm Corey. I also live in Minnesota. I don't know why. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, and I am Justin's mom. Justin is our oldest. How many kids do you have, Corey? We have three, but I consider that we have six because they all have wonderful, significant others. And your mom's going to be sweet. See, this is nice. Okay. Um, <laughs> so we'll start off a little bit here. I'm going to kind of do things backwards a little bit, I guess. Corey, can you tell me what you remember about Justin's diagnosis? Yeah, it was actually very memorable because we found out that he was diabetic in a pretty unusual way. We were living in Minnesota, but my husband was being transferred to um, St. Louis. 
And so the night before we left, my husband was already gone. I was, and you can picture this, I had Justin, who was two, one week before his third birthday. I had Amanda, who was one, and I was pregnant. And wow, it is so cold the in night. Minnesota. <laughs> yeah, it is. <laughs> <laughs> There's not a lot of other things to do. No, just kidding. Um, so, what happened was uh, the night before, we had been outside swimming, playing, having a good time. And we stopped to get uh, a bite to eat. And unbeknownst to me, Justin is drinking everything on the table. Are you finished with this? He asks very nicely. And are you finished with that? He's drinking everything on the table. And I thought something was really odd. But a friend of mine who was an ER nurse goes, oh, we've been outside. It's hot. You know, no big deal. Well, by the time we go to get on the plane the next morning, he's again drinking everything in sight. He has to go to the bathroom. And he is potty trained, but he has to go to the bathroom frequently. And we get on the flight and we get to St. Louis. And mind you, I'm by myself with two babies pregnant. And I think, you know what? Something's not right. So I pull into um, what looks like a pediatric clinic because, again, my first day in St. Louis and we know no one. Yeah. I pull in and I sit, you know, take them out of the car seats and so on. And I go in and I give them what I don't know, but they should know, classic diabetic symptoms. His eyes are very dark. He looks very um, dehydrated. He's, you know, thirsty all the time. And of course, he has to go to the bathroom all the time. And I tell him, I just need to know if this is life threatening or if it's just a virus. And they're like, well, you know, we're really busy. It's 10 o'clock in the morning. We're really busy. We can't see him until about four. And they kind of look at me like, oh, she's just being overprotective. I'm sorry, you cut out. And, um, she's just oh, what? I said being overprotective. Gotcha. And that's not my nature. I usually handle things pretty well. Right. So I'm like, well, okay, I guess it's not life threatening. And I bundle them back up in the car. And mind you, it's 100 degrees in St. Louis. It's, you know, summer. Mm-hmm. Um, bundle back up in the car. And I start to drive down the road. And I'm like, no, something is not right. I need to get this checked. So I said, I'm just going to take him to the emergency room. But of course, I don't know where I'm going. And this is long before cell phones. Sure. It's even long before MapQuest, if we can imagine. So for all the youngsters out there, yeah, way before. Um, so I think I'll just take him to an emergency room. Well, I missed the entrance to an emergency room down the road. Um, but then I see another like high rise clinic. So I go, well, you know what, we'll just go there and I'll see if somebody else will just take a look at him. By this point, he has to go to the bathroom again. We go in and I just hit a button that I see pediatric. You know, so it's just one doctor on one floor kind of thing. And I go in and I say the same thing. I just need to know if this is life threatening or if this is just, you know, a cold or virus. They were so dear. They took us in immediately. They did a quick test and they said, Mrs. Emil, I don't want to alarm you, but your son is less than 12 hours from going into a coma. He has type 1 diabetes. I'll tell you right now, that's not an alarming sentence at all. You were probably fine pregnant with your little children in a brand new (laughs) place. (laughs) So, and that's what I said. I am not someone who panics. So I said, Oh my gosh. And to be honest, I was just so thankful to Fair know answer. what it was yeah, of course. and to know that it was something we could deal with. Mm-hmm. So at that point I just said, could I please borrow your phone so I can let my husband know he's at his place of work. And can you please give me directions for where I need to go? Because they had also said, we've called ahead to Cardinal Glennon Children's Memorial Hospital downtown St. Louis. Right. Now, mind you, I'm on way on the south side of St. Louis, my very first day there. So they give me all the directions. I put the kids back in the car. We drive to um, the hospital. 
And by this point, they've both fallen asleep. And Justin's becoming more and more lethargic by mm -hmm. the minute. Yeah. Dying's another word for it. Yeah. Pretty He's, much. Yeah, exactly. Pretty much. Mm -hmm. So we get there again. Like I said, it's 100 degrees. I take one out of the car seat. I start to take the other one out. The security guard was just wonderful. He's like, may I help you? I said, that would be wonderful. So he picks up Amanda, uh, carries her in. I carry Justin in. And Justin is so far gone at this point. And this is just happening rapidly. Right, right. That they, uh, we were in the ER for six hours. Um, and I held him when they put his IV in mm -hmm. because he was that lethargic. Yeah. And fortunately for us, we say this so, so, so many times. We were meant to find this out in St. Louis because Cardinal Glennon Children's Memorial Hospital is across the street from Washington University, the premier diabetic research hospital. At the time. At the time. <laughs> so yes, things have changed. So I, have, so I have a couple of questions. First of all, this is like yeah. a classic Midwestern experience. You, you know, you just, people are taking you in, you know, you did get turned away at first, but you know, everybody's very happy at, to help you once you're there. Um, scary or no time to be scared? Do you remember at all? And Justin, I'm interested too. Do you know this story or is this the first time you're hearing it? I know the story, but I was obviously out of it at the time. So I, it's, it's pure hearsay, which is kind of why I thought it would be a good idea for my mom to actually tell it. Yeah, it's super interesting. Um, and I thought it would be interesting even to, to kind of hear yours. I mean, you're three. So, I mean, honestly, I don't remember one thing from when I was three. I don't know a lot of people that do, but, <laughs> yeah. you know, this 30, 30, exactly. 36 years ago, this happened to you. And, you know, it's just like she's borrowing people's phones to call them. And, you know, can I can I borrow your telephone? And, she, you know, she left out the part where it was like a rotary dial phone hanging on the wall of the, of the office, probably. She, she she also left out the part where hadn't even got to our new house yet. Yeah. Yeah, you're just like, there, right? Yeah, it's my first basically our first hour or two in St. Louis mm. in a rental car. And uh yeah, it's I will tell you honestly that I was not so much scared. I was truly I was scared because I knew something was happening and I felt like they didn't take me seriously at the first place. So that was a big deal to me. And so then when I got the answer, well, I thought it was a monumental uh, piece of news to get. Mm -hmm. Obviously I was so, so thankful to know what it was. Anyone who's gone through an undiagnosed illness knows the relief that comes when somebody tells you what it is finally, because you put so much effort oh. and time into worrying and thinking and trying to figure it out and going to different doctors. And then everybody's always like, well, maybe it's this. And you're like, well, that doesn't seem like an answer. Uh, an answer is sometimes very comforting, even if it's not the answer you want. Absolutely. Yeah. And then I, I will be really honest too, in that when he was in the hospital, so of course they admitted him. And so our first six days in St. Louis was in the hospital. Right. Um, and it's funny, the little things that happen. I happen to have color book and crayons and things. So Amanda was underneath Justin's bed mm -hmm. coloring. She was just being fantastic. And I think, you know, kids rise to the occasion when there's things going on. Yeah. So she she was wonderful. Justin was absolutely amazing. Um, because once he started to get IVs in and those sorts of things, you know, we uh, got him back pretty quickly, and, and that was great. But um, I remember them worrying so much about us being overwhelmed and being really frightened. Um, and I think both both Jim and I, my husband and I, um, just do really well with information. So at that time, of course, there wasn't Google. And I said, I'm fine, but can you get me all the information that you have. And I said, I don't want the layman's terms. I want all the medical documents. Yeah. And they gave me everything. It was wonderful. And then I'm just a voracious researcher and reader anyway. And you poured through it. So that became my mission. My mission was 
find out absolutely everything possible what to make the, sure that Justin could have the best life. How was the treatment 33 years ago? Was it regular and MPH? Did you even have a meter in your house? How did all that work? Oh, that yeah, that's interesting. It was regular and MPH. Um, and uh, we tested blood sugar, but it was uh, basically just on a uh, a stick. Yeah. And then, you know, you were checking that and getting your, your ratings. And then, uh, but... Because we were in St. Louis, it was very different than a lot of places that I've heard of um, in that he was having multiple shots from the beginning. Mm -hmm. So he he had four shots a day, which was not common for a lot of the protocols elsewhere. Yeah. Um, And so we felt very fortunate about that. And then he also tested his blood sugar six to eight times a day. But he was he was amazing because. Um, I grew up, um, so I'm 61. Mm -hmm. Um, and so when I grew up, it was kind of that, uh, whole time of free spirited people. And you would see things on TV is black and white TV, but (laughs) things on TV where people were doing things with needles and so on. And I, I was really pretty afraid of needles. Okay. Um, you know, of course you have to have a shot. So I would do that without any problem but it was something i was like oh i could never be a nurse or i could never you know that was not my thing right and then i end up having a child who's diabetic is that is and this, is this the 60s or those no the 70s the for one? him he well when i grew up or when he was oh, no born, he was born in the 80s he was born in the 80s but where you when yeah. you're talking about you're growing that time period yeah. for yourself so well i lived in california at the time so i was I spent a lot of time in San Francisco and so on. Mm -hmm. And that would have been like, for me, I was in the hospital, uh, San Francisco general for, uh, a complicated elbow surgery. Okay. Um, and that was right in the time it was like 1967, 1968. Gotcha. Yeah. So that was kind of that big free, you know, free love. There's a whole space in there, the Vietnam war and, and absolutely. Yeah. That's all that. Yeah. It's a weird time so, that yeah. I don't know if people who aren't there don't realize probably all the culture yeah, that no. was happening and kind of banging into each other at the moment. Um, exactly. So for me, I thought, oh my gosh, I should be the last person to have a child that has to have shots every but day. But you figured you know? it out, right? Well, I, t- I will tell you honestly, I'm practicing on an orange. Jim was as well. And the nurses were giving him his shots those first couple of days. Mm-hmm. And then one day, Justin looks up and he says, mommy, will you give me my shot? And, what are you and inside, do? I went. Oh, no, we're going to give you up for adoption. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, holy crap! And you know what? He was so brave right. through the entire thing that I thought, if he can be this brave, I have to be this brave. Good and it was probably the best thing because it made me have to do it. Yeah. And no, once excellent. you do it once, then you're fine. Sure. You know, but that first time, I was Freaking dreading out. it, and he he made me. He made me strong because he was so strong. Yeah, that's very cool. So um, how long do you think, Justin, How do you, when do you remember picking up your care? Like when did you guys, did you transfer it over? Or did you just all sort of do it together for a very long time? How did that all work in your memory? In my memory, I remember, I remember starting to give myself shots like, Eight ish, nine ish, somewhere in that range. Six. Um, six? Okay. Yeah. Memories. You started testing your blood sugar at four. Wow. You could pee on a stick mm-hmm. when you were four, Justin. Good for you. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, I feel like it is, it, I feel like, it, I mean, not full control, obviously, but I, I remember yeah. doing a lot like, as soon as I could okay, kind of thing um, because self-sufficiency I, or something. I, I don't know. Um, it's just something you were trying, you, you, you were inclined to try it even at a young age and you did. Yeah. yeah. I mean, s- still, I mean, to this day, I don't, I don't like needles either. Like <laughs> I, I go, I go and get my blood drawn at the doctors and I like have a nervous, like, I don't want someone else st- stabbing. I'll stab myself. Thank you very much. Like, <laughs> I don't need but, to do it. Yeah. <laughs> you're right. Um, but yeah, I, I remember 
doing I, mean, I remember doing a lot of it since as as long as I like I don't remember not doing ever it. doing it. Yeah, no, I hear that exactly. When did so, Justin? T- in today's like world, you have a pump, you have a CGM. Like, is that how you manage? Yep, I, I tandem. Uh, I'm, I'm on old. I'm on old tech. Uh, G4 and uh, Dexcom G4. Okay, how do you find that still? <laughs> I love it. <laughs> yeah, it's amazing, isn't it? And that's something. That's that's real perspective, actually, Justin. Because I I was talking about this with someone the other day, like literally the other day, where you um. I, it was with an old school person who'd been around diabetes for 50 years and they were mentioning how uh, it freaks them out when someone says, oh, you know, my Dexcom lost its uh, signal for 10 minutes. This thing <laughs> it's a pain in the butt. And the guy's like, they have no idea what they're, I mean, I guess like, he said it's relative to their life, I guess. He's like, but they have no idea how far we've come so quickly. A- ab- absolutely. Yeah. Like, that you know, I, so true. I started listening Actually, the, the first podcast I listened to of yours was the because it popped up in my like Google News feed about Costco carrying G six stuff. Oh, I remember that moment in time when that happened. <laughs> yes, and and I, I that was the first podcast I ever listened to, and and I was like, you know, I'd had I'd had a Dexcom for a while and a pump and yada yada yada, but like. And I, and again, I, I come from a strong, like I, we've been pre bolusing since I was three. Yeah. Like taking a shot half an hour before meals was kind of always the thing. Common, yeah. So like people who've like never heard of it, I'm like, what? Like confused. Like I've, I've known about that since 1983. Mm-hmm. Like, but I started listening and it, it, it immediately kind of kicked in a gear and and I think I've said this on like the the discussion group like it put it in a framework that put a a technique to all of the information that I knew if that makes sense no it does I'm glad too um because it's like I had all the tools I have all the knowledge like why are my a1c's eight and a half Mm. or whatever you know what I mean of course um but I, but, but the one thing I didn't have, like I had the old Dexcom G4. So I immediately went on a search cause I, I went too bold too early real fast and had some bonkers lows, mm-hmm. some like real hardcore, like Van Gogh kaleidoscope <laughs> type type situations. Um, so that my, my girlfriend has a friend whose daughter is diabetic and she got me a G4 with the share function. Okay. Cause I never, I never had that. Right. So like once I had some bonkers lows, I'm like, I need other people to be able to see this, mm-hmm. like what's going on with my sugars. <laughs> Cause I'm being all crazy. Um, yeah. So like I th- just this year, like I've kicked it into gear and now my girlfriend can see my numbers and my mom can see my numbers and like, and yeah, you're, it's, and you're managing really well on on Dexcom tech that's two generations old. And yes. What were you able to? So this this time you're talking about, it's not that long ago. Like you've only been listening like inside of this calendar year. Is that right? Correct. Yeah. And where where did you get your A1C to so far? Um, my last one was six two or six three. Wow, that's very cool. And um, and I'll be honest, like like I was tracking it on clarity and 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 tide pool and like i've i've now i have all the things um basically that that i can that i can work with my g4 right that's excellent man um how's your variability and your time and range is it does it always get better or are you having trouble with it uh d uh variability is i'm i'm working on mm-hmm. that that's kind of the hard one time and range i mean my 70 to 120 time in range is isn't as great but if i put it to the the standard like on my clarity i put it to 70 to 180 because right. that's what all the doctors like to look at yeah and then i'm then i'm sitting at like 80 mm-hmm. percent. that's really great you know what i mean yeah congratulations that's wonderful now my I, I need to stop you for a second mom is this how does that feel to you is he's an adult now obviously 
and mm-hmm. and you're you know you're probably far removed from day to day being in contact with him about it but i want to know like does it feel any different being 61 to hear that he has a 62 than it would have been if he was 10 and this was happening oh yeah i think i think a lot has changed our goal always from the beginning was to to educate him you know enough so that if he was invited to a birthday party or he, you know, had an opportunity that they were doing a field trip at school, mm-hmm. you know, we didn't have the technology that is available now. Right. So if he was in charge, I mean, he had to learn pretty quickly how to be in charge and what choices to make for food and those kinds of things. But it was really important to me that he be able to know why to make the choices that you make yep. and how it would affect. Mm-hmm. But he, he literally said to me, was this a year ago, Justin, that, or, or maybe even shorter than that. He goes, mom, I have a present for you. It's, you know, 30, you know, 35 years too late, but here you go. And this was the first time I could actually see his blood sugars through the shared program. Oh, that's cool. Where there's so many parents now that, like you were saying, you know, oh, if they can't see something or something goes down for a short period of time, and they kind of panic. Right. And it's like, that was old school all the time. Yeah. I mean, anything that he did or whatever, we did not want him to be in this, you know, bubble or cocoon type of life. We wanted him to be able to do anything and everything that he wanted to do. Right. But that meant... He had to know what he was doing too. Yeah. And he was, he, you know, he's, he's smart, smart man. And uh, he was a pretty smart young man. Um, so he took those things pretty well, but I think we tried to understand that there had to be grace within that, those choices and those decisions too, as part of the learning process. Justin, do you and, think you're, I'm um, sorry, I'm sorry. I cut you off. Um, no, no, no. Justin, do you think that, your A1C being in the eights is a product of that was expectation as you were growing up. So you were hitting expectation in the eights at one point. That was what they told you. And now they, and then they said sevens and they always push the number. But was it not? Because it doesn't seem like to me it's a lack of your understanding or lack of trying. I think it was a, it's I'm going to ask you, like, it, was that just because that was the goal? I'll be honest, like I. Uh, no, I mean, my, my goal was never to be like my, I, I never, I always wanted to be good. It's not like I was like, I'm going to be crappy, but like, like <laughs> have, like having, having knowledge and having the, um, direction to use the knowledge are, are two different things. Okay. So like, I mean, like even, even my mom said it with diagnosis, like, I don't trust what they said. Like, I, I can't tell you how many doctors I've gone to and within 15 minutes or endos 15 minutes gone, I'm going to have to teach this person something like I'm out. Yeah. Yeah. I'm here. You no, know, I'm teaching the doctor. Great. And yeah, I don't, and, so, I, and I'm so, not exactly lighting the world on fire. So what does that say? Um, right. Yeah. So, so like I, I, I kind of had a distrust of like, don't, when I, when I got my first under seven, eight, when I was like the the first one, like the, like I teared up, it was like a six, four, or six, six or something. It was first one under seven in my whole life yeah. this year. Like the doctor, she looked at me and she went, I don't know if this is good. You know, usually when, when patients get under a seven, you know, risk for heart stuff goes up, this, that, and the other, this, that, and the other. And I looked at her and I went, for type ones or type twos. And she kind of stopped and went, you're right. Like, and then, and then she like immediately got on, on my page. Cause she realized she's not talking to someone who's needs to take a bunch of pills to get a six, six or whatever. You know what I mean? And it was very like, now I'm like her favorite patient. Cause I roll in with my laptop and I show her, all the tide pool stuff and all the clarity stuff. Like I don't, you know what I mean? She's usually bringing um, residents in who are like, Oh my God, I've never seen this before. 
You know what I mean? So it's like, finally, finally, I've I've built up a little trust with a doctor in for the first time in 36 years. And it's kind of cool. Yeah, (laughs) Yeah, it's amazing. It's crazy that they don't know about that stuff. It's great that you're introducing it to them. It's nice that they're receptive to it. They're not just putting up a wall, which happens to a lot of people when. and, And I'll be honest, like we're in Minnesota. I mean, I live in Minneapolis and what's what's the big company that's right in the cities here yeah. so like i i walk in with a tandem pump and they are confused it's very true medtronic is it's like if 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 minnesota if minnesota had a a, a state uh, insulin pump it would be it would be a medtronic pump i think it's oh absolutely yeah. and and like i was supposed to get a pump years and years ago but i it was they're like oh go to the IDC, which I, maybe they've changed, but they were, you know, I went to the international diabetes center that that's really well known here. Mm -hmm. And they're like, Oh, you need three months of exact logs. And you pretty much have to get an A1C under seven before we can even think about getting you a bump. And I was like, that makes zero. Just like you think like that makes zero sense. What what are you talking about? That's for sure. Well, it's it's definitely backwards. It's backwards. (laughs) Well, it's it's if they don't understand, then we can't give them more to understand. In in, in mm-hmm. and I don't know, I, mean, I feel like I say it a million times, but they either give you incomplete or wrong tools. Even if they give them to you, they don't tell you how to use them, and then they chastise you for not getting a great A one C with those tools, and tell you if you want more help, you're going to have to do better. Even though we've given you zero direction, good luck, and we'll and, see. You and later. I'll be honest, my my big my biggest issue recording. I'm not going to write down every finger stick I do ever like that's, it's not going to happen. No, just, Sorry. Most of this, most of this podcast exists because of my laziness around diabetes, not wanting to count carbs, not wanting to bring logs to doctors, you know, yeah. all that stuff. Like I'm like, Oh, really? Like, I'm, you know, and not because I'm lazy, but because it's, you're busy. And I'm even when that Arden was, you know, two, three years old, I didn't have time to sit down and, hack through months of data to show them, which by the way, when you showed it to them, they would sort of look at it like, Oh, I think I see a high here. It happened more than once. Like that's what I spent two days digging through data for. So you could like point to a uptick on a line. I could have figured that out. Like that's not helpful. You know, it's, I saw that for the last three months. Now, what do I do about it? You know? Absolutely. Balance is the key, and that's I I think that's really the the key to diabetes anyway. Is you've got to figure out how to balance all of the things that you are responsible for when you have type one diabetes mm-hmm. with having the most enriched life you can have. Corey, wouldn't you say that's, that's that's life too, not just diabetes? Like, oh, yeah, absolutely. Right. But I think there's a layer that gets added. Mm-hmm. That for those who don't have it, they don't realize because you are required because, you know, because of the diagnosis and the management of the illness, you are required to adhere to a certain amount of steps within your protocol to have a full life. So, yes, everyone everyone on the planet, you know, every human being, you know, has certain responsibilities and certain things that they have to do for self-care. But if you have diabetes, whether it be one or two, but one specifically, there are requirements you you cannot shirk. Right. Yeah. There's some stuff. It you would just be have nice some days. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It would be nice if some days you could just get a vacation from it. But as a parent watching a child or other people, you know, um, never, you know, for Justin to never get a vacation from that, mm-hmm. you know, kind of, kind of breaks my heart. It's sad. There's nothing I can do about it, but man, if I, if I had one wish, you know, well, first of all, he wouldn't, <laughs> he wouldn't be diabetic. But hey, how days, nice is that, he, Justin? She to... didn't wish for money. That's really cool. <laughs> <laughs> he knows me. I would never wish for money. So there you go. I thought you were going to say, if I had one wish, 
What I'd do is I'd wish for three more wishes. Then my first wish would be that no matter what <laughs> happened, I couldn't die before I made my second wish. And my second mm-hmm. wish had to come true. My second wish would be that I'd have unlimited wishes. Then my third wish would be for no more diabetes. Because that's <laughs> I have it worked out that way in my mind, Corey, in case I ever meet a genie that comes out yeah. of a bottle. <laughs> yeah, I definitely know what I'm going to say. Because I figured I would get flustered in that moment and just ask for like a <laughs> Sunday or something like that, you know? Um, so no, but I, I think Justin knows that would be my that would be my big wish because of course, yeah. um, it's just one of those things that even just a break. Gosh, I think it would be wonderful. Mm-hmm. But now, Scott, remind me, how old are your children? My daughter, Arden, who has diabetes, is 15 and my son is a sophomore in college. He's going to turn 20 in a couple months. OK, so picture this. Justin knows what he's supposed to do. And and here's the thing, knowing what you're supposed to do and always doing it, it may not always be the same thing too. And, and I think that's just real life and us being human beings, but imagine, you know, they go off to college and well, we just happen to be in Minnesota and the college he goes to is all the way down in Louisiana. Mm -hmm. And so he goes down there, which, okay, that's not a big deal. You know, like he was ready, you know, to go and, and that was his path. That was great. But our insurance didn't have any affiliation with anything down in Louisiana. So when we dropped him off, their only advice was if he has any medical needs, he just needs to go to the emergency room. We, we had no doctor that we could align with. No one that he could go to and it would be partially covered. Nothing. This is going to be over before it starts. I just want to remind you to check out Touched by Type 1 at touchedbytype1.org. And don't forget to go check out that Contour Next 1 blood glucose meter at contournext.com forward slash juice box. That's it. Just a reminder. Right back to it. Let's find out what happened to Justin when he went away to college and learned how to be a chef, by the way. Ooh, wait, was that a spoiler? Hmm. All right, well, I don't remember now. So if it is, sorry, Justin's a chef. And if it's not, I should be paying closer attention. And Justin, that's not that long ago, right? 20 years? That was 90, yeah, 98, yeah. Ni- or 99, I guess. Okay. No, 98. Yeah, 98. And I remember us leaving Louisiana, and man, I, I cried, not because we were leaving him per se. Mm. I was worried because, let's be honest, kids are going to have fun. They might go out and, you know, have a drink here or there. Yep. You know, that's kind of part of college life. And Jim and I were not naive to think that he was going to, you know, like eat everything just the way he should right. and drink the things he should, whatever. And we had no backup plan medically other than the emergency room. That, that was just heart wrenching. And it, how'd it go? Did you ever have to make an emergency trip to Louisiana from Minnesota? Justin? Well, I, I went to the emergency room once, but they, yeah, they never came down for an emergency. Okay. Yeah. It wasn't so bad that like you were incapacitated and your mom had to jump on a plane and go back. And I'll be honest, like the, 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 I went into DKA like my junior year but it was spurned by like I got food poisoning mm-hmm. and it just domino affected the whole thing. Right. Yep. K- kind of deal. And that was pretty rough, but yeah, Justin, that was, what, uh, what'd you go to college to do? What were you trying to learn while you were there? I'm a, uh, I got a bachelor's in culinary arts. I'm a chef. Nice. You have your own restaurant. Uh, I run, uh, me and my girlfriend run an awesome underground restaurant in Minneapolis. It's very cool. So always in the same location or do you pop up or how do you handle it? Uh, both. We, we, we kind of have a central location and then we do, we do pop-ups also. Okay. Wow. That's really weird. Is, is that, I bet you, you didn't think that's what he would do, Corey, when you were looking at him when he was 10 years old, huh? Well, I didn't though. He kept saying that that's what he wanted to do. And he was, um, 
he was really, uh, really bright in school, but he was kind of bored. Mm -hmm. And because I also worked in the school system, I worked with uh, one of his coordinators and got him an apprenticeship to try culinary. Yeah. And my thought, truthfully, was that he would go down, they'd give him all of the grunt work, and he would realize really what a hard profession it is right. and how difficult it is, and he would no way do it. And he went down there. They were really good to him. He got to put rings and desserts when people were proposing to their mm -hmm. you know, girlfriend. He got to do all these really wonderful things, and he loved it. Okay. And it became his career. Justin, how, how good was the chef show on Netflix that came out a couple months ago with John Favreau and, um, those guys? I, th I think it's great. Yeah. I, I, it, that's fun. I mean, what I like about it is like, you, obviously John Favreau is not a chef, right. um, but you can tell that when he learns stuff, like he learns it. And I, I think that's cool. Like there's a lot of people on TV who like aren't chefs and, I can tell that they're not chefs mm -hmm. and he like his knife skills are pretty good and he doesn't have it down cause he doesn't do it every day, but he, he cares does it about right it. after he wants and he to cares it about right. it. Yeah. Yes. It's, it's very interesting. It's more than a, he's not just making food. Like he's trying to, he's trying to attain something. It's like watching someone try to teach themselves chess for their whole life. Like they're never going to get to be a grandmaster. <laughs> right. But they keep trying. It's very, very interesting. Yes. I remember, I remember the first day somebody showed me how to hold a knife correctly, like more back in your hand and, you know, thumb and forefinger up on the blade and that sort of thing. And I was like, yes. I didn't realize that at all. There we go. And, Absolutely. Yeah, so it's just little things to watch. Like it, you're right. It's like, it's just this guy that made a living cooking and still does next to this guy who just really wishes he could be good at it. And it's the I don't know. I found it delightful to watch. I really did. Yeah. It's, it's fun. Yeah. And it's, and it's weird, like how. I mean, I've gone through, you know, my teens and 20s and whatnot, like being in kitchens where you're around food constantly. Yeah. Um, and it's very different from the the young lady, the cake decorator who was on a couple months ago or Kelsey. whatever. Yeah. Kelsey, yes. Like she kind of has a quote unquote nine to five and she kind of does the same thing every day. Mm. And my days are completely bonkers and different and it's so hard to like get my basal rates down mm -hmm. because, because of that because your activity level and when you're act being active changes hey how so this is really like interesting because if you spent your time with food when you were young you're tasting it too so um how is that like how does that work when you're constantly around food and sometimes you're not just eating it because you're hungry you're eating it because you have to the the activity usually cancels out anything you're tasting. Because mm. you're not having a meal, you're having a couple of bites or a taste or a lick or something like that. I would say if it, at most it's it's usually like a lick. It's not even like a full bite. Right, and you're hustling around, and and it's hard work cooking. Like I don't know how much you know. How many meals do you make? Do you first of all you open seven days, and how many meals do you make a day? Uh, actually, we 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 are only open like two weekends a month. Okay. And we do five plus courses. It's kind of fine dining. Right. Um, for eight people at a time. So Justin, you cook for 30, 32 people a month, maybe, or not even like 16 people yeah, a month. And you, about, yeah, about that. And you're making a living or is you're not living in your mom's basement, are you? Justin? I'm, I'm no, I'm not, <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> but we, I, I pay the bills. Right. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I was like, you better start feeding more people, my man. But is, well, but that's the thing. It's, it's underground. Like it, what I'm doing isn't exactly the most, um, on board thing on the planet. Okay. So, so I, I, I can't, and, and our food culture here, like if I were where you're at, mm -hmm. I could probably do five days a week because there's more people and more people probably interested, uh -huh. but here there's a lot of people who say they're interested, but then when they say, you know, cause I don't, I don't basically people go online and they reserve tickets and then I send them the address the week, the week of the reservation they made. That's fun. So that's a little 
we, we live in a very sc- sort of Scandinavian society mm-hmm. and that's going to other people's houses is, is an odd thing here. No kidding. That's so, <laughs> Justin, that's really crazy that that works. I, I hope you scale that one day, like and make, cause it's a really, it's a fun idea. The idea like you'll pop up somewhere, you don't know where it's going to be. There's going to be this, this really wonderful, you know, multi course meal that's going to be there. And you kind of roll. I think that sounds, is that, your idea? Did you steal that from somebody, or where'd you come oh, up with that? Oh well, I mean the, the 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 kind of underground pop up thing isn't my idea, but I think the method of my menus and things is kind of different because I don't <clears throat> I give out like menu teasers, but I don't like post whole menus. Okay. And no menu no menu gets repeated. That's weird. Hey, no hey, menu item gets repeated. So you said that it's it's culturally odd in that area to just show up somewhere and eat, but is it also about the food? Is are you cooking off culture? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, yes. The, For the most part, absolutely. I our last our last dinner was kind of steakhouse themed. I wanted to it was kind of an homage to an idea I had a decade plus ago. But it was it was like steak it was like steakhouse food mm-hmm. that I wanted to turn on its head I guess so there was like a wedge salad had like a mosaic of slow roasted tomatoes and gorgonzola and a romaine I, uh, romaine sherbet and smoked tomatoes and smoked sherry vinegar and yeah I mean it was very on its head in a lot of ways so- which. I just, it's, it's creative and fun. Yeah. That's really amazing. I, I, I went to, you know, in high school, I just had technical school, took baking for a number of years and, um, I really enjoyed it. I wasn't good at working in the world at a bakery, uh, <laughs> but it was the getting up early in the morning thing. It just, it threw me for a loop. I was like, I'm not, Absolutely. I'm not starting work at one thirty in the morning for the rest of my life. Um, but I enjoy it enough that, you know, I cook at home and I am the person who cooks here every day too. So there's an episode of the podcast that went up today that I edited after I made dinner last night. Like I made dinner, cleaned up from dinner, packed it away, ran upstairs, finished the podcast, put it online. Um, <laughs> you know. See, and, and like I was talking about my basal rates, like, you know, you talk about stress and adrenaline, like affecting blood sugars. Yeah. yeah. Um, like my Friday night dinners are like the first run at the new menu. So like my stress and adrenaline are out out they they blow the sky away right and my my basal rates are minuscule okay like they're a third they're a third of what they normally are when you're working like that when when i'm when i'm working so i i have like a it's literally called friday like basal rate mm-hmm. profile it says friday but i can't test that because i won't have another friday for 2 weeks mm. So, so it, then, it works or it doesn't. I've got, one, I've got one for Saturday that's a little higher and a little different because the nerves of how the food might turn out or might be plated or whatever, like I'm a little more comfortable with it. Right. So they're higher. Yeah. But those are different than like my normal day. Right. Because they'd be way too low for like a normal day. That's something. So it's like I'm always wrestling. I'm always wrestling with that. Like. We had a we had a dinner a Saturday night in like late July where I was plating food. Again, we have eight people at my dining room and my girlfriend is I'm plating and she's feeding me M&Ms because my blood sugar is at like 62 for three hours. She's just pushing M&Ms through your lips while you're working. Yes. And and like I, I couldn't get it. I couldn't get it above 70 for three, four hours. And then when the dinner was done. I crashed. I crashed so hard and, and I was like, I was just an emotional low mess because I was stressed out and whatever. And like, I FaceTimed my mom, like laughing and crying just because I was like, my mom has to see how ridiculous everything is right now. And my mom's just like staring at me in the, in the phone going, eat some food. Right. Eat some food, like being mom. And I'm like, just look at, I, I'm eating food. Just, ah! <laughs> you know, I was like, I was like having like a, a meltdown, but I was like, I was like 40. Yeah. <laughs> Do you think that while you were working, the adrenaline was probably the only thing keeping your blood sugar at 70 even? 
probably. Yeah. It was it was crazy. I mean, it everything about it was was trying to trying to knock me down. It was it was crazy. But but I can't I can't basil test it because how do you basil test something twice a month? Right. How was the food though? Oh, it was awesome. Yeah, of course. <laughs> That's great. Uh, today, Justin was taken to the hospital, but the meals were fantastic. Uh, more yeah. of 11. Yeah. He seems happy, even though he's dizzy. And <laughs> Well, and it's fun because, like, I have, like, my, my, my sugars now, like, show up on my watch and whatever. And sure. every once in a while, we'll have a type 1 or parents of a type 1 that come to a dinner, and I'll be like, where, where are they at right now? Or where are you at right now? And I'll be like, I'm here. And they'll be like, oh, my God, you're doing all this work, and you're – 102 and i'm like yeah that's, this is great that's so cool. <laughs> i'm glad and and not to but you know we're coming up on the end a little bit i do want to understand the podcast has been helpful to you because you're you're in you mentioned the the private discussion group on facebook which by the way is astounds me every day 1700 people now i watched a woman ask a question this morning i read through everybody's responses and i just responded i'm like super proud of everybody. This was a, a really amazing thread the way um, like not one misstep in the, in the, um, in the responses. Like, you know, nice. like, you know, it's sometimes online you're like, you know, somebody will respond and like three of the people you're thinking like, Oh, they're just guessing. They don't know what they're talking about. Even this was like watching four or five brains come in who shared a thought process and they were thinking of different ideas and adding on valuable ways. And by the time the threads over, the original poster completely understood was comfortable. They had literally fixed her problem. And, um, I don't know, I'm really proud of the people who listen to this podcast who go in there and do that. Not that you have to or anything like that, but there are people who are motivated to do it and they, they speak in the language of the podcast. And you alluded to that earlier, like having like direction for the tools. Um, totally. And, yeah. I was hoping you could tell me a little bit about how that's changed things for you. Well, it's, it's things, I, I guess it's, it's, well, A, it was, you know, m moving the, the high line down to 120. Like I didn't, I didn't nudge mine down. Like, I think I listened to the two, two podcasts and it was at 120. Like <laughs> <laughs> from where, where did it start? Um, I, it was probably at, at 180 or 200 mm -hmm. just cause I know like 220 is ridiculous. Right. But, um, but it was it was more of don't <sighs> let me think it was the it was the old school idea that you're always going to get high after a meal mm -hmm. like that and, was and, unavoidable well like that that i just thought was that's the rule. that's all, that's what everyone's always said no one's ever said no you can make it not do that. Right. You know what I mean? Even though in my brain, in my brain, like the first time I got a CGM and a pump, I was like, Oh, I can figure this out. So it flatlines. Right. Like that was the first thing in my brain. But then I was like, I can't figure that out. And a, I, a, I can't figure it out. And B, I don't have the time to figure it out. Yeah. Well, I so, think that I do say that a lot, Justin, I really think that a great deal of the credit to me figuring this out is that I had the time to, I think sure. that's important, you know? But yeah, I was, I was always like, oh, if I eat a carb, I can figure out exactly how much my blood sugar will go up. So then I can, I should be able to then reverse engineer that to know exactly how much insulin I need. Yeah. And you know, that, that's all what's going through my brain when I first get this stuff, but then it's, it's still, you know, big spikes and this, that, and the other. And I guess I never looked at it kind of as going on the offensive versus being on the defensive. Yeah. That's something. It's just simple little ideas that, that, um, that paint a picture. I have, uh, who did, uh, I can't, it's funny. I don't name just like, was it Frazier? Who, who did Ali knock, f knock out flat Corey? You'll know who did Muhammad Ali lay right out on his face. It was Joe Frazier. I, right? I think it's Joe Frazier. Right. Yeah. So I use that old, I use that really famous photo when I speak in public and I just put it up and I'm like, look, you got to punch first. Like you can't lay back. You know, you want to be the one dictating the pace, which is a very sports oriented theme. But, you know, there's an idea of you don't show up on the field and like try to stop somebody from scoring. You show up on the field and try to run them over. And sure. And, and at least then the pace is yours. What happens next is based off of what you did 
and you're not blindly, like not just defending, but defending against something you don't really understand what it is or what it's about to do. You know, it's like, you know, I, I think but it's even, a, go ahead. But even Scott, um, you having a, this podcast, is such a blessing to so many people. I mean, think of how many people you affect and, and people you don't even know of, you know, that are affected by, by people who listen and follow you and, and so on. That impact that you are having, it has a ripple effect, you know, far beyond what, what you can even imagine. That's very and kind if, of you. If, one day makes a difference in someone's life. Yeah. That's huge. No, I know. I try not to think about it too many. much, Corey, because it makes me sad. Like, or not sad, I get like weepy. And hearing someone's <laughs> mom say it, Justin, it almost made me cry. Like, when people, <laughs> when people come on and they're like, yo, man, the podcast helped me, I'm like, right on, that's great. But I was like, now you're here and I'm thinking of you as a little kid and she's saying that. And I'm like, am I going to cry on this podcast? Probably not. I'm going to hold it together. But I really, those are very kind words and I really appreciate it, Corey. I have intellectually, I understand what you said and I try really hard not to think about it. I try to keep the podcast me talking to somebody else. Um, and well, I just imagine I, I think that you people have are to, You have to do the day to day thing. Yeah. But Justin will tell you, I'm very, I'm, I'm definitely an optimist and always looking for what's within our control. Mm -hmm. There's things that you can't control, of course, but that within that, what can you control? Yeah. And so any bit of information that you can get, if you have other people that um, are kind hearted and can help, you know, problem solve all those kinds of voices and all those kinds of pieces of input, just help people be more successful. Yeah. And, we, you know, we just, the bigger the community and the more knowledge that's available, the more people are helped. Yeah. And I think that's, that's the bottom line at the end of the day. It's very cool. I was, um, in Kansas city this past weekend speaking and, uh, I did three sessions. I did a, a, a one session that was about just thinking differently than maybe you had been, you know, talked to about this so far. The second session was like a breakdown of the ideas, the podcast and the tools and sort of how to put them into practice. And then nice. the, the third session I did a Q and a, and people just asked kind of real life questions from their, you know, their, their management. But when I was done, I went into a fourth session where I spoke to the, the kids that were there, like teens. And, you know, I sat them, like I didn't stand up on the stage. I like brought everybody into a couple of tables and we sat together in a quiet room, you know, and I just told them, I'm like, you know, look, I, I realize that up until now, things are not going well for you. And everybody who you have to trust seems like they don't have the answer. And that's making you feel like they don't know. So my concern was that I was going to say something new to your parents today. They were going to come home excited. And then you were going to look at them and go, oh, there's that old man again trying to get me to do something. But he doesn't know what he's talking about. <laughs> you know. So I said, I'm going to explain to you what I told them. And that was my goal for the talk. But midway through... Kids had 12, 13, 17 year old kids had paper out. They were taking notes. Like they were writing stuff down. They wanted That's better. Awesome. They wanted better for themselves. They just didn't believe it existed. And, um, and I think I made them believe that it existed. And I just felt very good about that when I left. Like the whole day was terrific, but like talking to those kids made me feel good. Yeah. That was like the icing on the cake it for really sure. It really did. It made the flight home easier, is the, the way I would put it. <laughs> but I'm exhausted and now sitting on the plane going, ugh. <laughs> yeah but you know when you're mentally and physically exhausted because you've done good things that's a great feeling it, it was i had a wonderful weekend actually and, and it was very fulfilling and and i think i impacted people which um to me is great because i, I feel like if i move around the country in enough places and talk about stuff like this then those people like you said Corey, will start talking to each other and then one day i can stop doing this podcast um but, you know when when it, when people's lives don't start, you know, with expectations that are not great and no tools and things like that, that, that really mm -hmm. is my goal. So, well, and inform information is so powerful. Mm. No, of it course. really is. Corey, do you listen to the show ever? I do. Not I on do. the same fact, phone though, right, listening. Justin? We need two downloads for each per like a person is a download. Okay. Never listen together. 
<laughs> yeah, no, we we definitely. I'm. I think I'm. Way, I'm way ahead of where she's at in the yeah. the listening situation. That's really nice. Has it helped you talk to him by any chance? Um, I don't know. Justin, and I. Oh, well, I feel. I mean, we've always been pretty close, mm-hmm. and I feel like we can talk about anything. And um, I think he knows at the end of the day, whatever it is, uh, we always always have his back and always want, I think just generally for him to be happy and healthy and to, um, be able to, you know, really pursue his dreams, whatever that is. And we say that for all of our kids. Um, and we're fortunate because they're all grown and honestly, we like, we love hanging out with them. You know, oh, it's a good nice. time. Oh, I'm glad to hear that. My kids might talk to me when I get older. Um, were you, <laughs> Corey, were you keeping up with management or has the podcast kind of moved you into this, where the space is now? Do you mean as far as Justin's Di- Di- No, diabetes in general. Like, were you aware of everything that was going on or has, um, were you keeping A lot up? of it, you know, yeah, I kind of keep on top of things, not as much as Justin does at this particular point mm-hmm. because I, I... Um, I have other pursuits that I follow as well. And so, um, I, yeah, I'm always driven. I'm kind of a goal setter and I always am setting new goals for myself and things that I'm doing. So Justin will tell you, you know, uh, for a while I was running quite a bit. And so like listening to your podcast with, um, the gal who, uh, ran the marathon, Mm. That was, was uh, interesting. Wow. Yeah, it was. <laughs> um, so, you know, just listening to those kinds of things, just because I've run a few marathons and, you know, done that kind of thing. And then I decided I wanted to try and get my black belt um, when I was 60 wow. in karate. And so um, I've been working pretty diligently and I did that last December. Congratulations. Okay. And, let, yeah. let me, let me interrupt. Go ahead. <laughs> my, 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 she broke her freaking toe in the middle of one of the tests for the black belt. And she had the instructor straighten the toe out and she finished the test. <laughs> That's amazing. I couldn't do, I couldn't do my kicks. It was sticking. So it was my little toe, but it was sticking straight out to the side. <laughs> so I call over to him because I tried to keep going and I couldn't. And I'm like, I broke my toe. And he comes over with the tape and he thinks I just broke it. He doesn't realize that it's. Yak sideways. You know, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so he looks up at me and I'm like, just do it. Cause I, I was not going to fail. Right. I, I kind of suck at quitting. So I'm like, I, I'm not failing on my third and final screening towards black belt. Mm-hmm. So he quick pulled it, taped it together. And I was about a third into my test. So I still had two thirds left. Wow. But. How bad did it hurt anyway. when he pulled it straight? Well, you know, it was pretty quick and I was kind of on adrenaline. So I think I just did a quick yelp is what everyone tells me. Right. I was so focused on hurry up and let me keep going because I didn't want to fail. Okay. And it's so hard. It's like two, two plus hours as hard as you can go without any breaks. And um, it, like I said, you have to do three of those in order to then test for your black belt. Mm -hmm. And it was my third and final one. And if I would have failed, it would have been fine. I just would have had to start over Over again again. in January and do those three again. Yep. And I did not want to do that. And toes take forever to heal too. Oh yeah. yeah. It was, yeah, it was not great, but I still had all of my pad kicks and my fighting yet to do um, on my exam. Gotcha. So, yeah, right. anyway. well, that's in, that's that's. I, I guess Justin doesn't feel like he can quit anything. Um. <laughs> <laughs> no pressure. Exactly. No pressure. Well, I want to thank no, you I guys. Think, you know, do it your best. Yeah. So. No, I appreciate this a lot. And this was really cool. This was Justin's idea to try to get three people on at the same time, and I was all worried about the sound and everything. And I think this went really well. So I, I really appreciate this. Okay. And it was really cool to have the insight of, of two different people. You know, seeing a situation from two different angles. Um, hold on one second. My daughter is texting me. Um, it's um, lunchtime. Yeah, it is lunchtime. Hold on a second. Um, I, I changed her. We changed something about her ratio. So I have to redo the math on my head real quick. Um, 
there. I did the math. That was quick. See, this is this is real life. <laughs> yeah, uh, we real life. we're making we were making adjustments to some of her her settings yesterday, and so this is the first day of the of the new settings, and um, and she was she was like, well, I don't know how much it's supposed to do, and I was like, okay, so I just popped the number over. I'm waiting to see if she so- sees it, but her blood sugar is. Arden's blood sugar is 72 and she's going to lunch. Now. Nice. Yeah. She's been, nice. she's been right in that like 85 ish range. So how long have you had like a, a way to track her blood sugars? So you knew like when she was at school and things, how long have yeah, you had since that? Since G4 um, with the share. So now when G4 first came out, it came out with a cradle. And so it was a nighttime thing. So she'd go to bed, slide the G4 into a cradle. It would dock in the cradle. And then that would somehow, I forget how, would give it like access to the internet. And then you had a share. But without that cradle. Yeah, how many years ago? Oh my gosh. Corey, you know, make me Google. I'm not sure. Um, no, no, no. Hold on a second. Hold on now. Damn it. We'll figure it out. I'm going to, you know what I'll do? And this is kind of meta and creepy. I'm going to go to my own website and see when. Because I remember well, the reason why I'm asking is because you've had this time frame where you've been able to track. Yeah, I've had this very short window when I've been able to track all the rest of Justin's life. It's just Nothing. been blind. Yeah. Oh no, I had that before. By the way, I had the um. Yeah. Yeah, I had the uh, oh my gosh, like staring at her constantly, thinking, <laughs> you know, is she high? Is she low? Okay, I wrote a blog article on November 9th, 2012, that was called First Impressions Dexcom Platinum G4. Nice. So I guess about that long. Now, she was diagnosed in 2007, so 8, 9, 10. So I went five years without without it as well. Um, Yeah. Not great at it, by the way, uh, (laughs) A1C wise. I'm I'm even looking yeah. now. Oh my gosh, look at this. I haven't looked at this in a long time. Like there's a picture here of her <laughs> of her blood sugar being like 250 overnight and and but a pretty stable line and I'm probably like thinking back then, "Woo!" <laughs> 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 look at look at but this. But you are, you are right. They yeah. did not want Justin's A1C to to get too low. Right. They absolutely didn't. And um we would have some times where he would play hockey when he was little. Mm-hmm. He'd play hockey. And then we'd have to feed him a lot before we'd go to bed. And he would wake up with the worst blood sugar in the middle of the night, yeah. screaming. Yeah. I, um, um, we, I, could not, we could not feed him enough. I just helped a um, a family whose son plays ice hockey. And um, he's doing really well now. But we had to, like, it was tough. Like, we had to throw a lot of the, a lot of the ideas from the podcast needed to get, like, yeah. thrown at it. And then you really had to look at it, watch it happen, figure it out. Because... You know that this, this adrenaline, and then there's a fall off, and there's so much exertion, and then there's you know super hungry after the hockey game, and but there's a lot of things going on there. Um, yeah, it's a big mixed bag for ma- sure. Made me happy. My kid didn't play ice hockey when I was doing it. To be perfectly honest, I was like, oh, geez. <laughs> oh. but we figured it out. I mean, I think that's the important part is that it was in the end when you look back at what happened to those people, it was timing and amount. They were just. They were using their insulin at the wrong time. They were always chasing lows and chasing highs instead of being in front of them and not defending and blah, 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 all that other stuff. Um, yeah. Well, but, we, yeah. Yeah. I That's really, crazy. I'm having a great time, but I have to go on. I'm, I'm out of time on this side. So, um, so we I just, are too. I just really wanted to say thank you again. And, and I appreciate this. And Justin, congratulations on having a really unique business. That's, uh, that's pretty cool. Yeah, totally. And it, anyone who's out there listening, come, Find us on the interwebs. How do they find you? It's uh, scherzomn.com. Scherzo like music. S-C-H-E-R-Z-O-M-N.com. And uh, we've got a Facebook page and Instagram and Twitter if you're into Twitter. And yeah, it's pretty cool. I'm working on, I'm working on Jamie. What was that? What was that URL again? Give it to me one more time. Oh. S C H E R Z O M N dot com. Z O M N dot com. Is this so the man can't find you? Um, all right, I'll figure it out. <laughs> yeah, I 
my 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 girlfriend gets mad at me. She's like, "Why'd you have to pick such a something people can't pronounce?" I'm like, "It's scherzo. It's it's Italian." Like, <laughs> she's like, "Yeah, the only people who know that are people who are into music." I'm like, "Fair enough. Okay." <laughs> oh my god! All right, Justin, I am going to ask you to email me that link because I don't seem to be able to get it right. <laughs> But, okay. uh, but uh, seriously, send it to me. I'd love to put it in the show notes and help people find you. Okay, yeah, cool. Sure. Thank you. Absolutely. Corey, uh, Justin, I hope you have a great day. Thank you very much for doing this. Awesome. Thanks, Thank Scott. Thank you very much. Take care, guys. Thank you for doing what you do. Oh, you're very kind. I, I appreciate it. Thank you. Huge thanks to Justin and Corey for coming on the show and sharing their experience with type 1 diabetes. And thanks to the Contour Next One Blood Glucose Meter and Touched by Type 1 for sponsoring the show. There are links in the show notes of your podcast player or at juiceboxpodcast.com if you'd like to find out more about the sponsors.